Hi folks, Kevin here. Well, today I thought we'd continue with our discussion about the microbiome. Uh, previously, uh, we introduced lifestyle medicine and one of the important elements or factors that influence our quality of life and our duration of life, our health span and our lifespan is the microbiome those organisms that live on us and within us. And mostly we're gonna be talking about the gastrointestinal or the colonic, those ones in our large intestine microbiome as, as we go through this, this topic. So again, we are a collective. And previously we talked about on part one and this we're going to start on part two now. So here's a, uh, a photo micrograph from the Sonnenberg lab. And this won second place in the Nikon Small World Photo Contest in 2015. And this is such a gorgeous uh, image, I wanted to share this. And so what we're looking at here on the left uh, upper corner of the screen, from here over to left, all this beautiful yellow and red and pink fuchsia color here, what we have are all of the bacteria and other microorganisms as well, but the bacteria are all staining brightly here right now. So there's Firmicutes here, some of these yellowish green ones here, the fuchsia, the bacteroides. Here, this beautiful iridescent green color is the, is the mucus layer that is a barrier that protects the epithelial cells of the colon. And, uh, and it also supplies n nourishment to the microbes when there's scarcity of food. So if, they're, if they aren't getting their complex carbo carbohydrates, they aren't getting their fiber, they can consume some of this, uh, of the mucus as well. So this is a, a histologic section, uh, a tissue sample from a mouse's colon was taken, uh, put in uh, formaldehyde, I believe, and put on a microtome and thin slices were very, very super thin slices were put on a slide and stained. And I'm not sure just how it was done. I believe these were formalin fixed, but I don't know for certain. Anyways, uh, they uptook the stain and there's important things to look at. So over on this side, these blue little uh, spherical or uh, oblong uh, structures are are actually the nuclei of cells. And this cell right here, I believe, is a goblet cell. These are specialized cells that line our colon and produce the mucus and secrete the mucus outside of the cell and keep building this mucus layer. And, and that aids, we used to think it just aided in elimination of feces during defecation. And we knew that it, that it was a nutrient source for, for microbes as well. But there's so much more that we're learning since the, uh, the Human Microbiome Project has started. And although this, this section is from a mouse, uh, most of the studies start off with mouse studies as well. So one thing to appreciate is, is if this is the nucleus of a cell, and a cell is this big, then look at the relative size of all the bacteria. You get, it, get an idea of the relative, uh, how, how we're outnumbered by the microbes. And this is just one, you know, a flat plane that we're looking at. So I thought this photo was absolutely uh, beautiful and revealing as far as quantitative looking at the microbes that are there. Now, in the studies that they're doing, they'll be taking fecal samples and analyzing the genome of the microbes. They aren't necessarily um, doing lots and lots of histology and culturing and plating them out because that's been a problem for many years. The colon was a mystery organ for many years. We didn't have the ability to, uh, to culture them because they're in an anaerobic environment within the large intestine. So uh, since the development of, of the, the genome project, they can uh, type these, the, the genes of the bacteria that are here. And that's how we're learning so much information about the role of the microbiome at this point in time. But this uh, photo micrograph is just gorgeous and I wanted to share it with you. Now a bit about the, uh, the Sonnenbergs. Erica and Justin Sonnenberg, uh, Senior Research Scientist, Department of Immunology and Microbiology at the Stanford University School of Medicine. I got their book a, a couple of years ago. It's absolutely fantastic. I highly recommend it. 
it'll be in the uh, description uh, below the video. And uh, it, it covers so much detail. I've got, I've, I've got it on Audible, and I listen to that book every once in a while to just help, help, uh, help me learn more and more each time I listen to it. So it's, it's a wealth of information, and it's really what I, what I consider this just foundational information on the microbiome. It was my, my, my footer, if you will, for building the blocks to my foundation, to, the, to my knowledge base that I'm acquiring now. So here's one interesting study. So the question is, does the, the microbiota determine the physiologic outcome of, of people or animals? So they took germ-free animals and they wanted to know, will they adopt uh, the physiologic characteristics of the donor based on fecal transfers? So these are germ-free, meaning that these mice all come from the same uh, parent they're all taken by C-sections, and they were not given uh, straight milk. They were, all their food was sterilized, and they were kept in a, like the boy in a bubble. So they're kept, they're germ-free mice that were fed germ-free food, and they were kept in a germ-free environment, and they're all identical. And so one of the questions was, will, the, will they adopt the phenotype of their donor? So what is the phenotype? Well. It's what the organism looks like as a result of the interaction of the genotype, their genotype, with the environment. So we know these all have the same genotype, and they're all being given the same number of calories, they're fed the same volume of food, and the same diet. And now let's look at our donors. We have one donor that's normal body weight, one that's obese body weight, and one that's under body weight. So if this germ-free mouse is given uh, feces, a fecal transfer, from a normal body weight donor, what happens? Well, they adopt the, the, uh, the, the phenotype, or they look physiologically like their normal donor. Yes, they're, 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 uh, uh, that's what they may have looked like as well if they were given the same amount. But what if, what if the, 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 uh, their sibling kept in the same circumstances, fed the same food, was given a different uh, uh, donor uh, microbiome, one from an obese donor. Well, they developed the physiologic characteristics, the, the appearance, the phenotype of the donor. And what happens if, if, they're, if they uh, have an underweight donor? Well, they, they also adopt the phenotype of the, do of the donor. Wow, what implications, but these are just mice. So they also took identical twins. One twin had normal body weight, the other twin had an obese body weight. They used them as fecal donors, so they took fecal samples from both of them. They put them in, into identical, uh, genetically identical mice that were germ-free. Again, they were taken by C-section. They were kept in a, in a sterile environment. They were st fed sterile food each of them given the same number of calories and the same exact diet. What happened? They also took on the donor's phenotype. They physiologically look like the donors uh, did from, as a result of taking on the microbiome or the microbiota of the donor. So this really stimulated a lot of research. So what about the transferring uh, the microbiome or the microbiota of uh, donors. Could it benefit obese people? Could it benefit people with other chronic diseases? So there's many open trials investigating the potential uh, benefits uh, for treating and potentially reversing various disease processes. So the gastrointestinal micro microbiome has a role in metabolism. It can result in, in obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome. It has a role in the immune system, autoimmune dis disorders, uh, cancers, allergies, asthma. We know that the, the gastrointestinal microbiome also has a profound impact on our personality, our behavior, and brain functions. It does this through an interaction of the central nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and the enteric nervous system. Those, so the enteric nervous system is the brain and the bowel. That's why the, uh, the, the intestine has uh, peristalsis, but it's modulated by 
the autonomic nervous system and that's the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system so the sympathetic system is our fight or flight uh, responses to stimuli and our parasympathetic uh, uh, component of our autonomic sy system is the rest and recovery parts and our central nervous system is our brain and our spinal cord and and the interaction of these components there's a feedback mechanism that's called the brain gut axis can result in depression based on our microbiome aut autism spectrum disorders multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease this is all exciting area of research. So let's look at, at the, raising, or the rising level of some disease processes here in the United States. So uh, some studies have shown since the 1950s, 50s, uh, multiple sclerosis has been up over 300 uh, percent. The same thing, we're up to almost 400 percent with Crohn's disease. With asthma, since 1980, we're up to uh, a three, you know, 300 percent increase in, in the incidence. Uh, and we, when we look at the incidence of uh, type 1 diabetes since 1970, well, we're up over 200 percent increase in the incidence. So there's, these are problems we need to look at. What about other problems that are going on? Well, obesity. Obesity is a big problem all over the world. Obesity is increasing by 50% each decade. And it can take seven to 14 years off your lifespan. Not to, not to even mention what it can do for your health span, your quality of life, your ability to interact in, in, in you know, to be the best version of yourself, to be, to be on, at the top of your game. We know that there's all these diseases over here that are associated with, with obesity as well. So what about the incidence? So in 1990, we can see, geez, there really weren't any places that were purporting uh, greater than 14% uh, obesity uh, in the United States. By the year 2000, we could see, geez, the incidence in some cases were up to 24% ob obesity just in one decade. By 2010, we had some places uh, indicating that, hit, that they had over 30% obesity. Now, here we are in 2011. Here we are a 30 to 35 percent increase uh, incidence of, and this is self-reported. These are, are uh, people uh, you know, reporting themselves their incidence based on the surveys that were done. So here's 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. 2015, now we're up over 35% obesity rate in some locations, 2016. And so what does this tell us? So no state, and this is in 2016, no state had a prevalence of obesity less than 20%, no place less than one in five. Three states in the District of Columbia had a prevalence between 20 and 25%. 22 states in Guam had a prevalence between 25 and 30 percent. 20 states, Puerto Rico uh, and the Virgin Islands, had a prevalence be uh, between 30 and 35 percent. And five states, Alabama, Arkansas, uh, uh, Louisiana, and Mississippi, as well as West Virginia, all had a, pre a prevalence of obesity of 35 percent or greater. This has a profound impact on, you know, on lifestyle disorders. If the current trend keeps increasing, 50% of Americans will be obese by 2030. Health care costs are going to skyrocket. We are going to be completely dependent on being on medications. And our quality of life and duration of life and other disorders that are associated with obesity, well, it's, if you believe that this is going to happen, maybe it's time for you to invest in the pharmaceutical industry. <laughs> It's going to pay off, I guess. So what has changed over time? Well, our lifestyles have changed drastically. Diets are quite different now. We no longer have per periods of food scarcity. Uh, there's, we have very low fiber diets. We have high calorie diets. Our activity level are much less than what used to be. We're less fit. We're, we're obsessed with hygiene 
what we call good hygiene, disinfecting constantly. Everything's being disinfected. Antibiotics are over over prescribed, and so, and most antibiotics that are produced in the United States are used as growth enhancers for for livestock. We are exposed to too many chemicals in our homes. You know, uh, we're exposed to chemicals under our sinks, under our medicine cabinets, uh, the 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 components that we put into our laundry detergent. If we have carpeting, we have chemicals that, that are being off gas there and other building materials as well. We have fire, uh, flame retardants or fire retardants in many of the, the uh, components in our homes. We have chemicals that are in our body uh, conditioners and in the hairsprays. All of the different things that as some of the, the, the uh, pots and pans that we cook with have chemicals that get airborne. We're exposed to chemicals in our workplace. We're exposed to chemicals in our outside environment as well. So the microbiota is suspect. Uh, the good news, we're not stuck with our microbiota. We, we can, uh, if we change what we eat, our microbiota will change. We can test our feces to find out what our enterotype is. Remember back in the first part of the microbiome, uh, Dr. Greger gave us a video on how we can change our enterotype. We can have fe uh, fecal transfers to seed our gut. We can actually bank our, 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 our feces for at times when, when we need to, after chemotherapy, after being on antibiotics, after having a prolonged illness and all. So what are some of the challenges that are ahead of us? Each person's microbiota is as unique as a fingerprint. That is a challenge. Therefore, changes, it, it, you, we can't use a patented uh, formula for, of microbiota and say, here, take this probiotic and, uh, and it'll fix everyone who has asthma or it'll fix everyone who has obesity. It just doesn't work that way. There are too many factors. It's multifactorial and, and, and there is tremendous interdependence amongst each one of those factors that have an influence that ultimately determine our, our phenotype, our, our physiologic manifestations. So the other problem is FDA re regulations. The FDA is a reductionist uh, system. It's sim similar to the, to the medical industry. Currently, they regulate only targeted medications, something that's aimed to, to uh, trigger one mechanism, like a proton pump inhibitor, one of the most common medications sold in the United States at this time. Uh, it, it, it beyond, it's beyond belief that they could actually regulate trillions of living organisms and it, they just wouldn't have the ability to say, well, what is the safety and efficacy of, of such things? And so much of the FDA is let, left up to the pharmaceutical companies to say what it is that, that you're given. And the nutraceutical industry is pretty much uh, goes on their own. They just restrict it as far as how they can describe things. So... Uh, here's another big issue, funding for labs is, uh, doing the research. So this day and age, this is a huge concern of mine because what I see going on at this point is I see uh, more support for corporations and deregulation uh, for the corporations to do what, what they do, less ramifications if there's issues. So there's, uh, you know, laws that if you have an adverse reaction to a vaccination, you don't have the right to sue the manufacturer of the vac vac vaccine. Corporations are really have taken over the West, uh, taken over the United States. In this last year, there's been deregulation uh, one right after another, and what happens is that empowers corporations tremendously. And corporations are in the business to make, make, uh, make a profit and to share that profit with their shareholders, the, their investors. And that's entirely reasonable. That's part of the American capitalistic uh, paradigm. However, the things that are probably going to make the greatest impact on reducing autoimmune disorders, reducing cardiovascular disease, reducing obesity, reducing 
cancers and and all in asthma and Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis and diabetes uh, and all the the factors that are going to make the greatest impact can't really be monetized by corporations they make their money by selling you products that uh, that are prescribed and what we're talking about here is dietary changes and lifestyle changes and microbiomes as well. There are ways that they can make some money. They can sell uh, probiotics and prebiotics and those sorts of things. But if you're eating a high fiber diet, you're getting your prebiotics. You're getting the, the complex carbohydrates that will, that will meet the microbes needs. We just have to change those other elements. And what ends up happening if we're doing things right, we're no longer purchasing, no longer dependent on the medications. We no longer need the insulin. We no longer need the statins. We no longer need the beta blockers. We no longer need all of these other uh, components, the, the anti-inflammatory agents, the, the pain medications. And that is something that is our government isn't going to like because we're pretty much run by our corporations. So enough of my political uh, side there. So when, when we look at our microbiome, I'm always looking at uh, it as a permaculturist. And so we do a sector analysis. When we do a sector analysis on our property, on a piece of land, and we want to build a home there, we look at those factors that will, those elements that will have an impact on the home. Uh, we may look at the slope of the land, the climate of the land, the prevailing winds, uh, you know, the flooding prospects, the odor from nearby uh, smokestacks or the, or the factories, the, the environmental uh, factors, the people factors, everything that could have an impact on the home, in, both intrinsic and extrinsic. And we got to do the same thing when we look at the microbiome. Were you born by natural birth or were you taken by C-section? So what, what was your initial microbiome? Were you breastfed and given that human milk oligosaccharide or were you, were you bottle fed? What about the tribe that you're in? We, we, we tend to pass down uh, much of our microbiome, many of the characteristics from our, from our parentage, our families, our friends, our exposure to pets and animals, are, are working in the gardens, the soil that's there as well. Our diet, is it, is it fiber depleted or is it fiber rich? Our activity level, our level of fitness, the medications that we're on, the hygiene pr practices that we, we are in, the chemicals that we're exposed to, our age and our reproductive status. So all of these factors have a profound influence on our microbiome. So this is a very complex system and we need to analyze it in order to optimize our potential outcome. So when we look at the digestive system, there's just a couple of things that I wanna think of. So here's the, di the, the gastrointestinal tract taken out of the patient and over here, we have uh, the, the, the system. So if we look at the gastrointestinal system, I want you to think of it as a tube that passes through the body. Things enter the gastrointestinal system through the oral cavity and exit through the anus. When we eat a meal, we are not taking that into our body, it's passing through our body. And as things are broken down, they're absorbed through our intestinal wall and, and that's how they get into our body. It's through a process of secretion, digestion, and absorption that we go through. And the most important nutrients happen in our colon. So we have the esophagus that comes down into the stomach, and gastric acids are here, so it's a really high pH, so that helps to keep out pathogens from getting into our small intestine. And then we have the duodenum where, where the pancreas secretes uh, its exocrine, its digestive enzymes, and the liver or the biliary system excrete the, the bile acids into the small intestine, the beginning of the small intestine. Then that transfers into the large part of the, uh, the long part of the small intestine called the jejunum. And, uh, and then at the end of the small intestine is the ileum, another specialized area there as well. 
And then we go into the place where the microbiome really lives, the large intestine. We have the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon. And then the fecal ma matter moves out through our rectum and anus. So we have a very uh, low pH in our stomach, and it becomes neutral as we get into our colon. Uh, there's different colonies and far fewer numbers in our stomach. More num uh, 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 the numbers increase as we get into our duodenum and jejunum and increase more as we get into our ileum and cecum, but the greatest numbers are in our colon, the more neutral pH. So the three points that I wanted to make is this is a tube that passes through our body. We need a dynamic interaction between digestive enzymes, peristaltic activities, secretions, and absorption of nutrients to get in, ultimately the absorption of nutrients is when they get into us. And in the colon, we used to think of the colon, the large intestine, as being the storage place where, where we just absorbed fluid out of our large intestine. And the reason that we didn't know much about the colon is because it's an anaerobic environment. We, we didn't have the ability to culture and plate out all of these microorganisms. Every time that we tried to culture them, they die. We didn't have the means of doing it effectively. Since the Human Genome Project and genotyping, we can take these microorganisms and see the potential of what these genes can do and what they can take and break down fiber, these, pot, these complex carbohydrates, and turn them into. So. I hope that was adequate. So what about fiber and its role? The human genome contains about, contains about 17 genes that are capable of breaking down complex carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are not bad words. Carbohydrates are good for you. It's the complex, the polysaccharides uh, that we really wanna, wanna be thinking. The oligosaccharides and the polysaccharides, the ones that pass through our stomach and small intestine and are food for the uh, microbes. So what about the microbiome? They have between 60,000 and 100,000 genes to break down those complex carbohydrates. Uh, their main function is to break down these complex carbohydrates and their products are then absorbed in by the large intestine. And, and the standard American diet is sadly deficient in fiber. So now I'm going to cut to a, a, a video from uh, Dr. Gre Greger titled The Microbiome, uh, The Inside Story. And then we'll be back and I'll just close this video up. Recently, it's become apparent that our DNA does not tell the whole story of our individuality and other factors. Environmental factors play an important role in human health and disease thanks to two revolutions in biology. First there was epigenetics, where diet and lifestyle changes have been shown to turn genes on and off. And the second, our unfolding understanding of our microbiome, how changes in our gut flora appear to impact greatly on human biology. Until relatively recently, the colon was viewed as a retention tank for waste, and water absorption was its big biological function. The problem was it was hard to get in there, and we weren't able to grow most of the bugs in a lab. As many as 99% of all microbes fail to grow under standard laboratory conditions, and so how do you study something you can't study? Ah, but now we have fancy genetic techniques. It took 13 years to sequence the DNA of the first bacteria ever. These days the same feat might only take two hours. And what we learned is that we can each be thought of as a superorganism, a kind of human-microbe hybrid. We have trillions of bacteria living inside us. One commentator went as far as to say we are all bacterias, a provocative way of acknowledging that there are more bacterial cells and genes in our own body than there are human cells and genes. And most of those bacteria live in our gut. All animals and plants appear to establish these, these symbiotic relationships with microorganisms, and in us, our gut flora can be considered like a forgotten organ. Health-promoting effects of good bacteria include boosting our immune system, improving digestion and absorption. They make vitamins, inhibit the growth of potential pathogens, and keep us from feeling bloated. But should bad bacteria take roost, 
They can produce carcinogens, putrefy protein in our gut, produce toxins, mess up our bowel function, and cause infections. Researchers are still in the process of figuring out which bacteria are which. Uh, there are more than a thousand different types of bacteria that take up residence in the human colon. Uh, just to give you a sense of the complexity, let me show you a diagram from a typical study of gut flora. This happens to be the largest such study done on the elderly, showing the frailest older folks tend to harbor similar bugs, suggesting further maybe the lousy diet in nursing homes that's causing the shift, which may play a role in ill health as we grow older, as you can clearly see in Figure 4. I mean, duh! Thankfully, not all microbiome diagrams are that complex. Based on studying what uh, comes out of twins, those that eat different habitual diets and stools from around the world, it has become evident that diet has a dominant role on the bacteria in our colon, and the diet-driven changes in it occur within days to weeks. Change our diet, change our gut flora. The hope of impacting health through diet it may be one of the oldest concepts in medicine. However, only in recent years has our understanding of human physiology grown to a point where we can begin to understand how individual dietary components affect specific illnesses through our gut bacteria. Milk fat on that piece of pizza, for example, may complex with bile and feed a bacteria that produces the rotten egg gas hydrogen sulfide and has experimentally been associated with colitis, inflammatory bowel disease. Fiber, on the other hand, feeds our good bacteria and decreases inflammation in the colon. Choline, uh, found in eggs, seafood, and poultry, as well as carnitine and red meat, can be turned into trimethylamine oxide and contribute to heart disease and perhaps fatty liver disease. And excess iron may muck with our good bacteria and contribute to inflammation as well. The good news is that specific dietary interventions offer exciting potential for non-toxic physiologic ways to alter gut microbiology and metabolism to benefit the natural course of many intestinal and systemic disorders. Well, okay, I'm back. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the video and it was helpful. I'd really appreciate it if you'd give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends and subscribe. Let people know, let me know if this is of value to you. Down below there are going to be some links for The Good Gut by the Sonnenbergs and How Not to Die by Dr. Greger as well. These are really valuable resources to have, and if you want to learn more about the, the microbiome, I really recommend that you get the, the, good, the good Gut by the Sonnenbergs. They're absolutely amazing people doing fantastic research. So again, give us a thumbs up if you like it, share it with your friends, and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. Thanks so much, folks, and have a great day. Bye-bye now. Thank you.